Hi students, a very warm welcome to you all to the chemistry classes. So I hope everybody is doing great. Now, what I had asked in the last class, I had asked a question related to nomenclature and that too again related to its common name. So the compound was this. So that was the compound, we had decided the IUPAC name for that. What was the IUPAC name? So depending upon the alphabetical order of the name of the substituents. So this is methyl, this is chloro. So I had told you the name would be 1 chloro, 1 chloro, 1, 2, 3, 4 and 4 methyl benzene, right? So everybody must be knowing that. Now the question was what was the common name for this particular compound? Common name. So as, as I told you it's completely different from what we have written over here, not at all associated because what we are going to do while deciding the common name for this substance is if I don't consider this chlorine, I have got a benzene attached with a methyl. So this particular compound which you see over here, this particular compound, this is the common name I am telling you. So this is nothing but the toluene, right? And as soon as I get an attachment in the toluene and that too, which position is this? This is nothing but the para position. So that is the para position. What do I call it as now? So it will be para chloro. That means I am associating, I am considering this chlorine as the substituent, right? So since this is considered as the substituent, so I'll be telling the position of that substituent, right? And that too, again commonly used. Why? Because I am not representing this as the numbers. Whenever I'm having the common name, we do not, do not represent those as numbers, but the positions that is ortho, meta and para, right? So it will be para chloro, finally. What is the name of the remaining compound? The toluene, right? So that is how you need to mention the common name for a particular compound, right? But I am not saying that such scenario will be followed in each and every compound. There will be a slight difference in each and one of those, right? So what we can consider over here, let me just ask, <clears throat> if I write it like that. Now what will it be? I am asking the common name again. So as we all know that this particular compound is none other than toluene as I told you. So this iodine is present on the ortho position. We can very well see that, right? So since this is ortho, it will be ortho iodo toluene, right? Clear? Now let me just ask you a question now related to again the nomenclature. You need to find out the IUPAC name for this particular compound. No need to go into the detail of the common name because there is no such common name. I have randomly formed this particular compound. So what you are going to do? What will be the first and foremost approach over here? So the first approach over here will be, here you can see there is a, some kind of a bond line structure which is going on. So I need to convert this bond line structure into the structural formula basically. So here, if I try to convert it, if I try to have the carbons over here, so what will it be? CH, no, it will be just C. 
just C it will be H a double bond carbon again H and a bond comes up here this junction over here is none other than the carbon so that is the carbon a hydrogen a bromine and let's have a CH3 over here so that is how the chain looks like and if you see this in a complicated manner it could be very confusing if you see it like this what we can do is we can simplify by writing it in a proper chain a proper straight chain so that is what we can form over here a proper straight chain right this is how we are going to form it I hope everybody is able to make that now the, sim the question has become quite simple over here so earlier it was something like this making us confused creating so much of dilemma but now the confusion has been cleared since we have simplified our structure so what you have to do in the examination is if you are getting confused in such structures first try to simplify do not just go on and try to number the carbons do not do that if you don't have enough practice before the exam so you could be confused in such questions what do you have to do again simplify it or else what you can do is you can just simply number the carbons over here and have a proper chain right so that depends entirely on your perspective how you see a compound some of you might get confused some of you might not be right so here what do I want to do now I have got bromine I have got a double bond so what will be the preferred choice so as I told you the preferred choice will always be double bond whenever I have a substituent as well choosing the double bond over the substituent that is what we need to do 1 2 3 4 5 so it will be 4 bromo everybody knows that now and it's a 5 member chain so it will be pent 2 in clear <clears throat> so that is the name for the compound I hope everybody has got it everybody has got the concept or not right now we are through with the nomenclature so nomenclature is such a vast thing that if we go on discussing the examples it could take many and lot many classes right so I have just picked up a few examples over here we have just discussed a little of them just to give you an idea that what would be the approach in each one of them right be it aromatic or be it just the simple aliphatic ones right so you need to practice a lot more questions related to IUPAC nomenclature also what we are going to do we are going to discuss some of the questions in the exercises also right so whenever we are taking up the exercise part whenever we are taking up the questionnaires I'll be discussing some of them right so now let's move on to the main topic that we have to discuss today that is the nature of the CX bond so since we already know that we are discussing about the haloalkanes and haloarenes what is halo halogen what is alkanes we all know that what are alkanes hydrocarbon chain and what are alkynes the triply bonded what are alkenes the doubly bonded everybody knows that and haloarenes that means aromatics right so what we are going to discuss is the nature of the CX bond first of all what is the point to discuss this nature once we get the nature how this particular CX bond is behaving then we can judge that what all reactions it can be able to perform right so that is why first we need to study the compound the atoms how they are connected how they are behaving and on the basis of behavior I can tell whether a person is able to interact with a social group or not right whether a person is an introvert or an extrovert right so that is how we always try to find out or try to judge the people right and what we are going to do is we 
we are going to judge now the CX bond so that we are able to judge whether the CX bond is able to perform such reactions or not, right? So I have got CX bond. X stands for the halogen naturally. Everybody knows that. So the halogen over here could be fluorine, chlorine, bromine and iodine, right? Now what you are going to do over here is, I have now represented this carbon with all the four valencies, right? While discussing some nature, do not forget ever the valencies. You need to particularly always complete the carbon valencies, right? Now, what do you see over here? First, we talk about the bond. How is the bond behaving? First is this particular question. <clears throat> so, if you see over here, if you are not able to judge its behavior just by looking at the X, what we can do is over here is I can just replace X with one of the halogens, right? So that would be pretty easy to find out the nature. See, let's say I'm putting up chlorine, right? Now, chlorine and carbon, comparing the electronegativities between the two. electronegativities between the two. Now basically chlorine and carbon, how do you judge the electronegativities first of all? So what do you see? Try to imagine, try to have a picture of the periodic table, right? Or just consider the periodic table. You might be having it right now. If not, you can open it right in front of your eyes. What do you see over here in the periodic table is as we move along the period there comes up the carbon and later on in the group 17 comes up the halogens right that is fluorine, chlorine, bromine, iodine. That means whenever I am going along the period the size of the atom decreases right. As the size of the atom decreases, the nucleus power increases. That means the electronegativity of a particular atom increases. Clear? That is why halogens coming at the group 17, that means the second last group, that means they will be having smaller size as compared to what I have in carbon. Right? So what I can say over here is, <clears throat> Halogens are smaller in size than the carbons. Clear? <clears throat> than the, not carbons, but carbon, right? That means what? Electronegativity will be increasing for the halogens. So if I say electronegativity, of halogens is greater than electronegativity of the carbon, right? We can infer that. Or what is the symbol for electronegativity? Does anybody know that? It is none other than chi. That is the symbol for electronegativity. Everybody needs to remember that, right? Now, as we know that halogen is having higher electronegativity as compared to the carbon, that means here you can see the bond. So the bond has got two electrons in it. Now these two electrons, since this is what kind of a bond? Have you realized that? This is none other than the covalent bond. Why is it covalent? Why have we jumped onto such conclusion that it is covalent? Why? Because carbon always forms covalent bonds most of the times with some atoms, right? So here if I consider the halogen atom, halogen needs one electron, right? Whereas if you see carbon also needs one electron, 
because three of the valencies may be fulfilled by rest of the three groups any of the groups let us just say hydrogens so it could be ch3cl right <clears throat> now what carbon is left with carbon is left with one atom oh, sorry one electron over here it needs one more to complete its valency right also it has to give one to the chlorine as well so what the both of them could do they could share the electrons and sharing of electrons is none other than having a covalent bond clear so i hope everybody is clear with the fact so what do we know what do we infer from here is it's a covalent bond first of all right so since this is a covalent bond but still what do you observe we observe that chlorine that this x is more electronegative it's pulling the shared pair of electron towards itself right so what will it be it will be partially polar as well so it develops a slight polarity as well delta negative delta positive so what we can do over here is earlier it was if i say it was perfectly covalent so there were two electrons arranged exactly in the middle of the two atoms right now introducing the polarity and that too that polarity towards x it is pulling the electrons so here what is x doing x is pulling the shared pair of electrons thereby making it partially polar so as soon as i introduce the polarity what will happen now we'll see carefully <laughs> the electrons got shifted somewhat towards the x can you see the shifting over here so the electronegativity due to the electronegativity of x which is more more electronegativity right due to which it's pulling the shared pair of electrons it will be delta negative and it's delta positive clear so that is how the nature of cx bond is how is the bond it is first of all what do we write is it's covalent right and it has got polarity as well so these are the two factors making it <coughs> polar covalent bond right so that is the nature what you will see is what you will say you will say that it is polar covalent bond right so you must have observed something in alkanes alkene and alkynes they were having they were having a less reactivity why there was less reactivity because there were no poles existing in the alkanes alkenes and alkynes if you had observed alkanes if i consider there are two carbons both of them having same electronegativity shared pair of electron almost remain in the center thereby there will be no polarity in the two in between the two if there is polarity this bond is able to get cleaved very very easily in the form of x negative x negative can come off very easily whereas if i have got a non polar compound let's say ch3 ch3 that is ethane so this is unreactive just because it does not have any polarity in between right so due to the polarity due to this particular nature this very interesting nature of the cx bond we have got so many reactions via alkyl halides right so what do we observe we observe polar covalent nature 
fine. So that was it under the category of nature of the CX bond. What I am going to discuss now is if I put up different different halogens, what kind of bond lengths do we observe over here? Let us just discuss that. So you can also now apply your brains in this particular con concept. So I have got fluorine, chlorine, bromine, iodine. So I have got four things over here, four type of compounds. Here I have changed is what? I have changed the X, right? This is nothing but the halogen, nothing but the X. So what do you observe over here? Fluorine is most electronegative, right? Having the smallest size. So what is our inference? Fluorine, most electronegative. right this is the first thing and what could be said about fluorine what else fluorine is having smallest size right now as we move down the group right so as I move down the group the size of the halogen increases right everybody knows that so here, down the group, size of halogen increases, therefore now you can imagine this iodine will be having so many shells, right, as compared to the bromine, it will be having two or three and as compared to chlorine, it will be having just Two, I'm just having a rough picture uh, over here, right? So, number of shells increasing, the size of the entire atom is increasing, thereby the bond length will also increase. It's quite visible over here. Number of shells are increasing, so the distance between the two is also increasing. So here, <clears throat> the bond length is also increasing now what kind of bond length I'm talking about over here so here I'm talking about is the CX bond length basically right so that is the important thing that you need to note down over here, clear? So that is how I am going to judge which will be having the highest bond length. Higher the bond length, what will be the strength? Strength will be the least and thereby it can break off very easily. So the reactivity order, what we can say is, if I move down the group, the bond can get, the bond can get cleaved very easily, thereby it can participate in the reaction very, very easily right so here what else I can write is the bond strength decreases clear so that was the entire fact I hope everybody has got the concept that was quite simple what you need to remember basically here is the bond is polar covalent right it has got covalency, it has got polarity, that is why, that is the reason it participates in the reactions, we will see later on that what all reactions does it perform, right? So that is why this bond can get cleaved and X negative, that is the halide ion can come off, clear? And that is how we correlate the bond lens. I hope that is completely clear to you. Now let's move on to the preparation of our haloalkanes and haloarenes, right? I hope you are very well clear with the idea, very well clear with the nature of the CX bond. So in each and every chapter concerned with organic, first we will study the nature of that particular compound, right? That particular 
if we are considering aldehyde or ketone, what will be the nature? First, we'll be discussing the nature. Then we'll be discussing how it performed the various reactions, right? So that will be a stepwise thing, clear? So what do you need to do? What we are going to start off with is preparation of haloalkanes first. Right? In this, one very, very important thing that is preparation from alcohols. I can say the best possible method. I need to prepare a haloalkane. First, I'm not discussing the reactions, what all reactions does haloalkane perform but what are the different preparation methods i need to prepare the haloalkane first in my laboratory how can i obtain that so alcohols are very much and commonly available right so since the alcohols are so commonly available i can have different reactions to perform to form this haloalkanes right so first and foremost the reaction would be preparation from alcohols. A general reaction if I take up an alcohol and quite an important method also. Mark this as important. Why? I'll tell you in a moment why this is so important process over here. In the presence of HCl, it could be dilute, it could be conch right most of the times what do we take is we take concentrated hydrochloric acid in the presence of a catalyst you need to have an idea about each and everything which is used over here right I'll be discussing the role of each one of them so what do we get is RCl right this is the prime product that we are going to form over here. Clear? RCl plus what I am left with is H2O. You must be thinking that I haven't included any byproduct related to zinc over here. Why? You need to give me the answer to this particular question. And also what we will be discussing in the next session is what is the name for this particular reaction? Quite an interesting one. We'll be discussing a stepwise method, a stepwise mechanism for this as well, right? So I'll be back in the next session. Have a very, very good day.